Good afternoon, I am Vicky McCullum with the Friday edition of the Our City COVID-19 News Show. We will be updating you on the latest information and resources around the COVID-19 pandemic while unpacking deeper issues as they emerge. We encourage you to get in touch with us. We welcome contributions from movements, healthcare providers and our audience. We would like this program to be a two-way flow of information. As the national lockdown continues, the current number of confirmed COVID-19 cases stands at 12,739 with 5,676 recoveries and 238 deaths. The Western Cape has 7,220 confirmed cases, 2,573 recoveries and 129 deaths. The distribution of food parcels has been a major challenge during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Students' Health and Welfare Centre's organisation, known as SHORCO, has raised 300,000 rand in aid of helping the needy in areas such as Mannenberg, Imizamoyetu and Hangberg. This was part of the hashtag BeKindOnline campaign. SHORCO teamed up with a group of social media influencers to raise the money, which provides both meals and sanitation kits. The campaign ran from the 23rd of April to the 1st of May. A 42-year-old Surrey estate resident, Malik Fakhuddin, has warned of the severity of the coronavirus after his 70-year-old father died from COVID-19. In a Facebook post last week, Fakhuddin wrote about the days leading up to his father's death, saying the family did not get to say goodbye as they weren't allowed to visit him in hospital. They were left shocked by the sudden death and urged South Africans to stop being ignorant and flouting the lockdown rules. Fakhuddin says the family doesn't know where his father contracted the virus, but says he had visited friends and family during the lockdown. He has reminded followers that should a family member contract the virus, they will suffer alone. Staff at the Rylands branch of Checkers have downed tools temporarily after seven positive cases of COVID-19 were confirmed at the supermarket. Staff claim their lives are in danger and are calling on management to conduct more tests and cater to the needs of those already infected. We spoke to Kotla Kanamea, who is a chef at Checkers Rylands. No one, no one hears him. Many doesn't even phone him and ask him, how are you doing? No answer to him. No answer to the staff. All we hear, you must wait a black and white through paper must come from the health department. I can not understand why doesn't the health department come in here? It's already seven cases in the store. We're currently outside with the people, the other seven cases that they have, but we're screaming for help. Why must we let customers come in if the virus is in the store? We scream the store. We don't say kill the business, kill shop right or check the business. The store seems to have just all the quiet from our team. Yeah. Nothing more we want from them. That is all what we're asking them because the store has never been sanitized. The health department never gave us a go ahead for them, right? As, as, as safe for us to go. We understand if you're negative, you come back to work. We acquire for that. We agree to that. Isn't that you say we don't want to come to work? Please call me in every time in the office, but you can't give me a feedback. This is killing my stuff. Look at me, I was naked. Look at me, I came in one day back here. I'm sick, I must go back to the doctor. Yeah. Because if no one's speaking for our stuff here, they dictate us to work. Yeah. So it's wrong what they're doing. They're killing my people. Yeah. They're killing my friends inside. They're not killing all the people who's positive. They don't ask our thing. They're not even phoning. I have to do it. Work all this all put stuff away for them. They're not getting paid. It's serious. Yeah. I mean, they're killing families. They're not even taking out people in a safe area doing a, nothing. They're doing it all. So maybe they showed me more of the night. I mean, really, now it's not nice. Cape Town TV tried to get hold of checkers, but to no avail. 
West NK Premier Alan Windy says most people who contract COVID-19 will recover and 90% won't need to be hospitalized. The Premier's earlier push for the Western Cape to move to level three of the lockdown, along with its hotspot plan, has been criticized by opposition parties and civil society. Wendy says the healthcare system is prepared and it is simply no longer possible to maintain level four restrictions anywhere in South Africa. However, the ANC's Cameron Dugmore has disagreed, labeling the statement as reckless. The city of Cape Town has released a statement dispelling misinformation about a positive COVID-19 case at the now-closed Strandfontein Temporary Shelter for Homeless People. This came after being informed that one of the persons moved off-site to a smaller shelter had tested positive for the coronavirus. The city says the asymptomatic individual was screened at least three times by city health, health officials and the results of those screenings were negative. MECO member for Health Services, Zahid Badruddin, has this to say. The city of Cape Town has been informed by a service provider at one of the shelters that a person who has moved off uh, the, the Stramfontein site to a smaller shelter has tested positive um, for COVID-19. In keeping with all the protocols, this asymptomatic individual um, was screened at least three times by city health officials. Uh, the result of these screenings were all negative. A test uh, was then conducted by this organization at a private facility, which then found this positive result. City Health is assisting the NGO uh, with case management at the shelter and is also in the process of tracking and monitoring others who were transferred uh, to other facilities during this period. The individual is currently in isolation and remains asymptomatic. The city's health department, supported by external services, are currently assessing uh, the position on site. The city further is aware of the misinformation being shared by, by an appointed um, Human Rights Commission monitor. The monitor has once again failed to consult with the city to verify the information prior to distributing uh, the report to the organizations. The city must dispel this misrepres misrepresentation of the facts and will impress the necessity to follow the necessary protocols when screening and testing all individuals. It is irresponsible for this monitor to create ill-informed mass hysteria. South Africa's online stores are now permitted to sell any products besides alcohol and cigarettes. The Western Cape government has welcomed the directive with the province's finance and economic opportunities minister, David Maynier, saying the decision is good for business and consumers. According to Maynier, up to 30,000 small businesses make use of some of the larger e-commerce trading platforms to sell their products. The regulations were published after consultations with Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs Minister Kosizana Tlabini Zuma. It's time for an ad break. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back. You're still watching the Our City COVID-19 show with me, Vicky McCullum. We will be giving you the latest updates on the COVID-19 pandemic and sharing essential resources and information with you. The South African Federation of Trade Unions, SAFTU, has launched a social media campaign to raise awareness among its members about the coronavirus. Ayanda Nabe speaks to SAFTU General Secretary Zwelinzi Mabavi, who recently recovered from the virus. Hello to the viewers at home. My name is Ayanda Nabe and welcome to our show. Today we are speaking to Comrade Bavis, Zuelin Zimavavi from SAFTU, the General Secretary. And he will be talking to us about the SAFTU media campaign launch, which happened on Tuesday. Um, Comrade Zuelin Zimavavi, welcome to our show. Thank you very much, Ayanda. Thanks for the opportunity you are giving me. And SAFTU, of course. Of course. Um, Comrade, let us start by asking, how are you feeling? We've heard so much about you having had the COVID-19 virus, and uh, we've seen how you have um, recorded your, your road to health. Uh, safe to assume that you are healthy. Um, we want to know, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing very well. I fought bad, back, and uh, I think that uh, I did very, very well following all of the orders from the doctors and also doing my own tricks at home. And uh, I'm happy to announce that uh, the virus was knocked out. It is now officially out of my body. No one have tested uh, 
positive again in my family. And uh, I think that I've made a small contribution because I always wanted to immediately, when I tested positive, uh, give hope to the people of the country that the virus can be defeated. The virus is not necessarily a death warrant. And, and, and more importantly, it is not okay. It is not smart to ostracize people who have tested positive. It is not okay to stigmatize the disease because if we were to do so, many people will end up dying and suffering in silence without the support of even their own family. And uh, the more of us comes out in public to pronounce that uh, we, we are positive and that we are fighting back, the more we're giving a hope to the rest of the country that uh, the virus is not a death warrant, that a small percentage of the population will die from it and uh, more likely you, you will have to have other complications before you, you are attacked by the virus for you to die. So I'm very happy that I'm now back on my strides and doing my work at home. And every time I go out, I do the, what the regulation says we must do. And we are happy. Mask. We are so happy that you're back. And of course, one thing that you might not be aware of that you did was to destigmatize the virus. So thank you very much for that. But coming back to the issues of the day, today we're talking about a very exciting program that SAFTU launched, the social media campaign. Could you take us through what that is about and why suddenly the SAFTU media campaign? And of course, we are also privy to the information that it really links to the COVID-19. So please take us to that. Well, uh, everybody says we will not go back to the normal as existed before the COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a new normal. Yes. And the new normal that we are being forced to, being locked down, unable to hold meetings, or where it has become illegal to gather more than 50 people in any way, not even for the funeral, we have to find a way, new ways, but old ways that we have ignored, but new ways to reach out to workers, to provide them with the information and uh, to give them uh, the education that they need to ensure that the solidarity between our members and that information is power and that, that with that power, they can recruit more workers into the unions and they can help more workers who, uh, out of the information we will provide, realize that uh, their employers are not uh, uh, complying with the regulations that have been announced by the government. That's the purpose of the social media platform. And, um, you know, of, what, of the things that you've said, I think maybe we should take them one by one. Um, you know, the one big challenge for SAFT1, imagine, is the biggest one is not being able to do business as usual. Organizing needs to be a different way. That we need to em employ a different way of, uh, of organizing. So do you think social media is the appropriate platform to do that? It is not. It's not ideal. Because social media uh, basically is uh, uh, only covers the workers who can afford to buy some airtime, some data, and, uh, and therefore who can uh, link up and listen to a video. But for the overwhelming majority of South African workers, they are not on social media. They don't have uh, money to uh, buy bundles of airtime, of data, and therefore they are left out. We do accept that there is a big limitation in relation to that, but nevertheless, we still catch up some few that we can mm -hmm. and uh, to interact with, which is absolutely critical. And we've heard about these um, presentations, lectures. What are they going to be? I mean, uh, two a week? We've, uh, I mean, as CTV we've seen on your pamphlet, it says um, twice a week. Um, we've seen on the adverts that have been circulated, saying that on Tuesdays and Thursdays, 7 o'clock, there will be some activity <laughs> that SAF to host in relation to COVID-19. Is that the case, sir? 
Today, yes. we're doing the, yes. the real beginning of uh, those series. Today, the general secretary of our affiliate town will make a presentation on the returning to work regulations. He's going to unpack what are the regulations uh, requiring workers to do from the point they leave their homes, what the employer's obligations are in relation to sanitization or sanitizing uh, the workplaces, ensuring that there is high standards of hygiene, social distancing, uh, personal protective equipment. He's going to unpack what uh, what workers should uh, uh, ensure uh, the workplace uh, is looking like when they arrive, and what should they do if the employers do not comply with the regulations. So that's what was going to be today, and we're asking every worker who can tune in to that live streaming in our Facebook. And uh, on Tuesday, we've already secured the initial commissioner of the UIF to come and explain how does these relief measures announced by the government work? And ordinarily, how do workers go about claiming their UIF contributions? And uh, so he's going to unpack, in particular, to respond to questions that workers are going to ask in advance as to why the, the Department of Labor is unable to cope, why the employers seem to have uh, deserted them at this critical moment, and why they are starving, whereas they have made contributions to the UIF. And we're yeah. going to pick up the next issue about social development. We're going to look at what is the level of readiness in the public sector. The frontliners in South Africa have been and, dying in numbers and because of course, they, they have protections from the government. Safe to assume that if I'm interested to know which topics we'll be having when, there will be. A, I can follow you on, on your Facebook. And that's where I'll see the list of, active, of, of uh, presentations that you'll be having. Um, Comrade Vavid, this is the end of our show, unfortunately. And um, thank you so much for being with us. We hope to catch up with Safdu at a later stage. And, and we will keep you accountable. We want to see that you hold, we hold you accountable to the commitments that you are making to workers today. Um, but having said that, thank you very much for your presence. Following, following a failed meeting with Western Cape Premier Alan Windy, who had to go into isolation after contact with the coronavirus victim, President Sul Ramaphosa travelled to the Eastern Cape, where he met with the Premier of the province, Oscar Mubayane, to observe how they were curbing the spread of COVID-19. At the same time, and at the present, same period, 133,850 persons were screened and at the roadblocks, which are also health checkpoints, whilst 158,000 people were screened during level five. A total of 1,501 cases were opened during level five lockdown. These are including a lot of uh, the, the wrongdoing, President, gender-based violence, break-ins, we had a situation of these break-ins even for schools. At some point, we had about 75 schools that uh, suffered this. But the uh, police have been doing very well to follow up and uh, deal with such kind of uh, situation. On the provision of beds for COVID-19, uh, President, the progress is reported uh, as such. More beds are incrementally being made available to the Western region on order uh, to respond to the epicenter demands for beds. President Seal Ramaphosa then took to the podium where he reiterated that some regions will scale down to level 3, while other would remain on level 4. He said the decisions to do so come from consultation with scientists. The Eastern Cape has so far recorded 1,569 cases of coronavirus. Yesterday I announced that we're going to be having consultations with a view of moving to level three. I must make it clear that we are moving to level three. Many parts of the country will go to level three. 
There are certain areas in the country that are hot spots, which we are going to be talking about to demonstrate precisely the incidence of infections. This country, yes, is bound to go from level three as well to level two and finally level one. We are not stuck in level four. I need to make that very clear. We are now going to migrate to level three so that we can loosen up a number of restrictions so that the economy can start operating once again. And we have said from the onset that our purpose is to save lives, but at the same time to save livelihoods. Because our people have to live, so therefore the economy is also important. And let me immediately add, we are not the only country in the world that is having to deal with loosening up the lockdowns that many countries have embarked upon around the world. Many countries are now looking very closely at how they can ease their restrictions. And we have decided that we are going to do it in an orderly manner because we've been advised by scientists that if you do it abruptly, you risk running a reinfection rate that could start happening. Now, we are managing that. Now, of course, not all of us will agree on the strategic approach that we have taken, but we believe that this is the strategic approach that is appropriate to enable us to save the lives of our people. For Our City News, I am Octavian Glovo. This is a story about books in an unlikely place and the struggle to get them into the hands of people during the national lockdown. South Africa's eased lockdown regulations mean books will finally be available for sale again, but in the nation's biggest city, with its reputation for speed and hustle, what does this mean? Voice of America's Anita Powell takes us on a literary journey through the unlikeliest of literary towns. Once upon a time, journalist and writer Griffin Shea embarked on his dream of opening a bookstore in downtown Johannesburg. Then came the plot twist. A deadly virus became a global pandemic. Millions fell ill across the world. Hundreds of thousands died. South Africa announced a total 35-day lockdown to try to stop the spread. All non-essential businesses had to close, Shea's included. Johannesburg, the mining town founded because of its massive underground gold seam, likes to tell a story about itself. This, we say, is a town of people on the move, with no time to stop and take in something as indulgent as a book. That story, Shea says, is just not true. We have 12 booksellers in, within one block of the store. So when people came to me like, oh, why are you open a bookstore in the CBD? Like, no one reads down there. And it's like, well, the real challenge is, how am I going to compete with all these other booksellers? Like, how are we going to differentiate ourselves? There's this World Cities Cultural Report. Basically, it's looking at like, how many cinemas do you have? How many movie theaters? How many libraries? How many bookstores? And the last time Joburg participated, we actually had more bookstores than almost any other city surveyed. So we had more than Berlin, more than Sydney, more than New York. We had just a few fewer than Paris. But we don't tell ourselves that story. Now, as South Africa begins to slowly ease the lockdown, the government says books of educational value are allowed for sale. Most booksellers, Shea included, are taking a very liberal view of that, arguing all books have educational value. Uh, and, and it's important for people to have books at, at this time more than anything else. Emotionally, books are important psychologically, educationally, culturally as well, you know, for, for the community, African language speaking community, uh, there's been a big move especially by younger people, to, to read in their own languages. On a bright August, so we asked him to get in on the pandemic trend of reading aloud. This is a selection from his new children's book, the first story ever told. Enjoy. When the world was new, in the first village there ever was, lived a mother, a father, and ten children. The mother worked during the day, 
and father carved animals for the children to play with. They were very happy. Until one night, the children couldn't sleep. We want a story. Mother and father didn't know any stories. It's new and not much had happened yet. So they in a media briefing held by the World Health Organization, Executive Director of the WHO's Health Emergencies Program, Michael Ryan and Dr. Maria van Kirchhoff have addressed the issue of the coronavirus's longevity and discussed the best collective efforts to curb its spread. Uh, we have a new virus entering the human population for, uh, for the first time. Uh, and therefore, it is very hard to predict when uh, we will uh, we will prevail over it. What is clear, and I think uh, maybe what uh, Sumia may have been alluding to, is that the current zero prevalence of the current number of people in our population who've been infected is actually relatively low. Uh, and if you're a scientist and you project forward in the absence of a vaccine and you try and calculate how long is it going to take for enough people to become infected so that this disease settles into an, an endemic phase, and we may never, and I think it's important to, uh, to put this on the table. This virus may become just another endemic virus in our communities, and this virus may never go away. HIV has not gone away, but we've come to terms with the virus, and we have found the therapies, and we've found the prevention methods, and people don't feel as scared uh, as they did before, and we're offering life to people with HIV, long, healthy lives to people with HIV. Uh, and I'm not comparing the two diseases, but I think it is important that we're realistic. And I don't think anyone can predict when or if this disease will disappear. We do have one great hope. If we do find a highly effective vaccine uh, that we can distribute to, uh, to everyone who needs it in the world, we, want, we may have a shot at eliminating uh, this, uh, this uh, virus. Um, but that, vi that vaccine will have to be available. It will have to be highly effective, it will have to be made available to everyone and we will have to use it. Uh, before we began responding to this event on the 31st of December, uh, we were heavily involved and had teams in the Western Pacific uh, working on measles. Uh, at that time, every single ventilator, and we've, we've learned about ventilators, all of us uh, around the world in the last, uh, a lot of people talk about ventilators. Uh, the uh, I think there were 14 ventilators in Western Samoa at that time, and uh, all 14 were occupied by young children. And they were occupied by young children who had a devastating disease. It was called measles, and they weren't vaccinated against that disease. So uh, forgive me if I'm cynical, but we have some perfectly effective vaccines on this planet that we have not used effectively for diseases we could eliminate and eradicate, and we haven't done it. We've lacked the will, we've lacked the, the determination to invest in health systems to deliver that. We've lacked the capacity to sustain primary health care at the front end. Uh, and therefore, science can come up with the vaccine. But someone's got to make it, and we've got to make enough of it, that everyone can get a dose of it, and we've got to be able to deliver that. And people have got to want to take that vaccine. Every single one of those steps is fraught with challenges. Uh, it's a massive opportunity for the world. Uh, the idea that a new disease could emerge, cause a pandemic, and we could, with a massive moonshot, uh, find a vaccine and give that to everyone who needs it and stop this disease in its tracks, uh, will turn uh, maybe what has been a tragic pandemic into a, a beacon of hope for the future of our planet and the way we care for our citizens and the way we work together to solve our problems. Uh, through solidarity, through trust, uh, through working together, uh, and through a multilateral system that can actually benefit mankind. So I think there are no promises in this, uh, and there are no dates. Uh, this disease may settle into a long-term problem. It may not be. Uh, in some senses, we have control over that future, but it's going to take a massive effort to do it. The DG has been calling for it. He's been speaking, bringing leaders together, trying to drive the issue so that we have access to COVID tools. Uh, we believe we have a coalition that can deliver on that, but it's going to need the political, the financial, the operational, the technical, and the community support to be a success. I, I just wanted to add that I, I, think, I think many people are, you know, in a state of feeling quite some despair 
You know, they've been, they've been at home for quite some time and they're going through very difficult situation. They've had loved ones who have been infected or who have died. Um, but I just want to say that, you know, the trajectory of this pandemic, the trajectory of this outbreak is in our hands. Um, and, it, and it's, we have seen in a number of countries without medical interventions, and as Mike said, we are, the, the global community has come together to work in solidarity to accelerate the development of a safe and effective vaccine and to come together to commit to have access to that safe and effective vaccine when it is available. But we have seen countries bring this virus under control. We have seen countries use public health measures, the fundamentals of public health and epidemiology and clinical care to bring the virus under control and to suppress transmission to a low enough level where communities can get back to work and communities can open up again. So we can't forget that. I mean, it will take some time before we have the information on these medical interventions and it's coming and people are working very hard on that. But this is in our hand and we are seeing hope in a number of countries and I really don't want people to forget that. When we, when we come back, I will update you on the latest on social media. Welcome back. You're still watching our City COVID-19 show. Lockdown has resulted in many learning new skills and polishing old ones from baking to cooking and DIY activities. The City of Cape Town has made a video on how to make a squeeze bottle with a two litre bottle, scissors and a tubing pipe. The following video comes to us in Afrikaans. Hi, I'm in ons gaan vandag hier een bij zo om die squeezie te kreeg te Wat je nodig hebt is een eerste keer het winde op top en een toppie, een zachte toppie. Um, je kan gewoon dit met die water bottels en dan een scherp voorwerp zoals een naald of een koffiespel waarmee je gaatjes gaan doen. Vat die toppie, dan druk je een gaatje in die middel met die naald en dan probeer je uit en je maakt zo so vijf gaatjes rond om dat eerste gaatje en dan maak je een tweede rij gaatjes zo so min of meer tien. Maar maak het zo so na aan moeilijk als die middel, zodat so die water niet weg ver verspreid is. En dan als het klaar gedoen is, dan plooi je die water zo so makkelijk zoals dit en je kan je handen baie makkelijk vast. En dan gaan we ons moeders handen was wat die minste 20 seconden is. En ons moet seep ook gebruik. So ons gaan eerst ons handen afspoor, een beetje, een beetje nat maak. En dan gaan ons het lekker smeer met die seep. Ja, als we zijn, als we zijn, lekker tussen die vingers hier, aan die rugkant van jouw hand was, de binnenkant bij die duimen, en natuurlijk ook die volse vorm op deel van je hand, zo so je moet zeker maken dat jouw hand was. En om zeker te maken dat je wel die correcte tijd was, als je niet voor doos hier of tijd kan tijd niet, dan kan je altijd die hebben dat zo een plek is. En dit jou ook de donas op ons. Of je nog aan de zon, wat je ziet, de donas op ons. En dan. En dan zit ons handen een beetje afspoel. Zeker maak ons het lekker afspoel. Dan maak je zeker dat je handen afdroog met een schoon handdoek. Of als je papier aan doet, kan je dit ook gebruiken. Maar maak je zeker dat je het niet op kleren gebruikt. Anders gaan je handen weer gecontamineerd worden. En je gaat altijd kiemen op je handen. Heen. And now for social media. You can share your thoughts with us on Facebook, we are Our City CT, and on Twitter at Our City CT. These are the popular hashtags on Twitter today. Hashtag Which South Africans, a two minute clip of a fiery on air confrontation between DA leader Star John Steenhuizen and SABC journalist Flo Letaba, has gone viral. The reporter questioned which South Africans Steenhuizen was referring to when he said South Africans were fed up with the lack of information from the government. Hashtag Burundi, this country has ordered top World Health Organization officials and the coronavirus experts coordinating its response to leave the country. Residents go to the polls soon and mass rallies are taking place. Burundi has also blocked African Union observers. After the ad break, the information on resources and places of safety that you can use during this period. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still tuned to Our City, The COVID Show with me, Vicky McCallum. 
for your latest news around the COVID-19 pandemic and to see what other Cape Tonians are doing to keep safe, tune in to Cape Town TV daily. These are some organizations helping communities stay safe during this period. That's all we have for you today, but if you have something to say, we want to hear from you. Send your comments, news and questions to us via Facebook at OurCityCT, on Twitter at OurCityCT, or via email on OurCity at CapetownTV.org. You can also call us on 021-448-0448. From me, Vicky McCullum and the Our City crew, have a great weekend. Goodbye. <laughs>